Hello, this is Professor Matt Catrullis with our next experiment on respiratory gases for the Chemistry 110 course and specifically we'll be looking at preparation and the properties of the respiratory gases oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now when we look at these gases we call them respiratory gases because they play a very significant role in our respiratory system uh, as well as other systems including our circulatory system. We should know at this point that oxygen gas O2 is taken into the body whenever we inhale and carbon dioxide is expelled when we exhale. Now oxygen isn't the only thing that we take in when we inhale. Air is mostly nitrogen so we also take in a lot of nitrogen and similarly when we exhale that nitrogen has to go somewhere the body doesn't take up most of it, so that nitrogen is also expelled along with the carbon dioxide. It is certainly possible that when we breathe we take in some carbon dioxide and it's also possible that when we exhale we exhale some oxygen as well. However, we're just going to keep this simple by saying we take in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. Now this procedure is the only one that we have which is not in the lab manual and it should have been provided to you by your instructor as a handout with a one page report sheet to turn in at the end. And I'm going to adapt all of the experimental videos um, from other videos that are already available on the internet. This is a rather difficult experiment for one person to videotape at a time. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts, so I'm going to use a lot of what's already out there. So you might see some slight differences in the procedures, specifically in the way that uh, the gases are generated, uh, but overall the observations would be just the same. So one way that we can prepare oxygen is to take hydrogen peroxide and it will decompose into water and oxygen. Now as was mentioned in the last lab, this is an extremely slow reaction, so we need to add a catalyst. In experiment 7, we added potassium iodide, which catalyzed the reaction, but it was extremely slow even with potassium iodide. So we're going to use a much better catalyst in this experiment, manganese 4 oxide, and that will almost seem to make this instantly decompose. So the presence of manganese dioxide speeds up the reaction, and remember with catalysts, we say they're not reactants. They are not used up in the reaction. They are not written on the reactant side or the product side, so we indicate their presence by writing them over the arrow. When you look at this, you should notice it is unbalanced, and on the report sheet, you will need to write a balanced version of this equation. If you wanted to pause right now and go ahead and do that, I think that would be a great idea. Now, the oxygen that's produced has to be collected in some way. We can't simply just wave the flask in front, right over the uh, decomposing hydrogen peroxide because that's going to push a lot of air into the flask as well. So we use a technique uh, called collecting a gas over water. So the gas, as you will see, is bubbled through a tube of water and the gas will then go ahead and bubble to the top of the bottle and that's because the gas is much less dense than the water and the gas is not very soluble in water and so that's why uh, you will see this process work. So some oxygen does dissolve but most of it doesn't. It is said to be only slightly soluble. So we know O2 if we were to draw the Lewis structure is a nonpolar molecule and we know that water is polar so we wouldn't expect oxygen to be very soluble. So the first video I'm going to refer you to and I'm going to give you a link uh, below and I'll call that video number one will show you this process preparing and collecting oxygen gas and the apparatus that the instructor uses in this case is a little bit fancier 
uh, than what we're showing you in your handout. But again, it does the exact same thing. It produces oxygen gas. So what that video will do is take you through the first step in part B. So you will see the preparation of oxygen and you will see him inserting a burning splint into the oxygen gas he produces. While you don't need to watch the entire video, you do need to watch at least through uh, 3 minutes and 20 seconds into the video. After this point, he does some acid base testing on the uh, oxygen and some of the other products that are produced and since we haven't covered acids and bases yet that would probably not be very useful to you but it doesn't hurt to watch it all if you'd like and when you're done you just want to come back to this video and continue where you left off now I'm assuming you have gone and watched that video and you've come back here to continue so let's talk about the rest of this experiment. Lime water uh, is a solution of calcium hydroxide. And normally it is just a clear and colorless liquid. It looks just like water. Now when we add oxygen gas to lime water, this is what we get. This is essentially lime water that has had oxygen added to it. Does it really look any different than water? Mm, not really. It's not a very interesting result. The next video that I'm going to link to, and that will be called Video 2, is much more impressive. And it will show the reaction of steel wool with oxygen. And to keep things simple, we're going to say that steel wool is entirely pure iron, uh, so iron solid. In reality, there's some other things mixed in there, but it's mostly iron, and that will keep this experiment simple. So what you want to watch when you're watching this video is first watch how the steel wool is reacting with oxygen from the air. So look at what you're observing as it's burning in just an open atmosphere and then compare to what you see when it's added to nearly pure oxygen. Now you also might want to search YouTube and find other videos that show iron reacting with oxygen. There's some really fascinating ones out there but I'm going to choose uh, this particular video because it shows the oxygen burning with air as well as burning with oxygen gas. So I'm assuming now you have completed all of the video watching needed to fill out your report sheet for part one. So you're going to want to answer the questions on the first page of the report sheet. So some guidance on this. So for A1, I already showed you the unbalanced equation. And in fact, I had said it might be a good idea to stop at this point and go back and write the balanced equation. So you need to be sure to balance it and then write it down. Now in the second part of B2, uh, you need to keep this in mind. We didn't show you many other gases being added to lime water and in fact you didn't see any at this point. But you need to be aware that there are many gases that if you add them to lime water it will have no effect. If I add nitrogen gas pure to lime water, it will stay clear and colorless. Helium, neon, all of those gases would have the exact same effect as oxygen on lime water. So what you want to ask yourself then is, will bubbling oxygen through lime water tell you that the gas is oxygen? So if you saw any gas being bubbled into the lime water, would you know that it had to be oxygen just on the basis of this experiment. So using these other facts here, that should make it easy to come to a conclusion. For B3, I want to simplify this. So the equation in words is the steel wool is iron plus oxygen gas. So that's your left side of your equation. And it makes iron 3 oxide as the product. 
So my hope is that it, this will make it much easier uh, to complete that equation. Be sure to balance it. I am not going to show you uh, B4, uh, which asks you to compare densities of some gases. So just draw a single line through the section on B4 and write not shown. Now I will continue on to the sections on carbon dioxide. If you need to pause to complete the report sheet, please feel free to do so. So carbon dioxide can be prepared in many different ways. And in experiment seven, we already saw one way in which it could be prepared. And that was by taking hydrochloric acid and adding it to solid sodium carbonate. The sodium carbonate dissolves immediately in the water with the acid and it then produces carbon dioxide gas. In this experiment we're going to be adding hydrochloric acid to marble chips which is just calcium carbonate and in fact the one video I will show you I think they just dispense with the marble chips altogether and instead simply use pure calcium carbonate. And so the unbalanced equation for this process is shown here. So we have hydrochloric acid plus calcium carbonate as opposed to sodium carbonate. And you'll notice it's very similar to the reaction above. We get water, carbon dioxide, and calcium chloride. You'll notice the reaction is not balanced. There's only one chlorine on the left and there's two chlorines on the right. So when you write this on your report sheet, make sure that you write the balanced equation. So I'm going to show here a couple links uh, showing carbon dioxide in a couple different ways interacting with the lime water. Remember, lime water is a calcium hydroxide solution in water. Now I don't have a video of lime water with air but I will just tell you this, if we were to take lime water and keep it open to the air, which you're actually seeing in the videos, just lime water open to the air, it looks just like ordinary water. So shaking it won't have a substantial effect. It, you, you don't see any change. It looks just like water. So the first video that you want to see, which is labeled as video number three in the links, will show the carbon dioxide being generated and then that generated carbon dioxide will be bubbled directly into lime water through a glass tube. The second video will show someone uh, blowing, which is essentially just exhaling very vigorously through a straw into a solution of lime water. And then finally I'm going to link to one more video, video number five, which will show a burning splint being inserted into a test tube filled with carbon dioxide. Now if you watched all of video number one, that was the one uh, involving the production of oxygen, if you watched all of it, at the end of that video the instructor added solid carbon to the oxygen and he burned it to make carbon dioxide and then he inserted a burning splint into that carbon dioxide. So you might have already seen that effect here. So let me give you some guidance on filling out the report sheet for part two. For A1, I already gave you the chemical equation. It was unbalanced. You just need to rewrite it and balance it. Now, one problem with this experiment as it is, is it really doesn't give you some of the necessary background that you need to answer A2 and A3, so I want to fill those gaps in. There are gases, ammonia probably being the best example, hydrogen chloride being another one, uh, that are extremely soluble in water. For example, you might look at this and go, oh, that's hydrochloric acid, and actually it's not. That's hydrogen chloride, as soon as you add that gas into water, that is what forms hydrochloric acid. That's how we can make it. So either of these gases, very, very soluble in water. 
And so if we hook a gas tank up to a plastic tube and run that plastic tube into a tank of water, when we start to turn on the tank and the gas comes out, uh, a lot of those bubbles just collapse. They look like uh, anything else that's dissolving uh, towards the bottom. Some of the gas bubbles will make it to the surface, but many of them won't. That's just showing them dissolving. So we want to answer an important question here about those gases. Are ammonia and hydrogen chloride polar, or are they nonpolar? That's going to be an important thing to keep in mind when you're looking at carbon dioxide and oxygen in just a minute. Now, we know that oxygen is at least somewhat soluble in water, and carbon dioxide is somewhat soluble in water. And the evidence for that is, well, fish need to breathe O2 just like we do. They don't get the O2 out of the O in water. So it's, they're not breathing the H2O oxygen. They're breathing the same oxygen as we do, O2. Uh, they use gills to accomplish that. So in order for fish to survive, there has to be oxygen dissolved in the water. If you ever build an aquarium, you will know that you need an air stone to bubble air through the water, which is where the oxygen comes through. Um, carbon dioxide, we know, dissolves in our sodas, and it stays there because it's dissolved at a very, very high pressure. And as we know, our soda cans or bottles are immediately sealed and are under extremely high pressure. As we all know from experience, when you open up a soda can or soda bottle, the carbon dioxide immediately starts to bubble out because you have immediately lowered the pressure. So the soda does eventually go flat because the carbon dioxide escapes. So while yes, both of these are soluble to an extent, it's a very limited extent. So I would say that these are only slightly soluble in water. When you bubble those into water, the bubbles mostly stay intact and they rise to the surface. You don't really see any of them dissolving. And now to contrast that with the soluble gases, the soluble gases, ammonia and HCl, you've already answered, are they polar or nonpolar? I want you to contrast your answer to that with your answer here. Are oxygen and carbon dioxide polar or nonpolar? And it wouldn't hurt to draw Lewis structures to figure that out. So on part B1, let me just give you the chemical reaction in words. Uh, and this is very much simplified, but it keeps it easier for you. It's calcium hydroxide reacts with carbon dioxide, forming calcium carbonate and water. Water is technically also a reactant over here, but when we balance it, some of the water would cancel out. And that's why I'm just simply giving you this net equation here. So you'll want to write that equation, and you'll need to balance it. When you go to answer B3, I want you to keep a few things in mind. For something to burn, like our burning splint, you need two things. In the case of the burning splint, first you needed fuel, which was the splint itself, the wood, and you also need a constant supply of oxygen. We know that there's enough oxygen in air for the burning splint to burn. We just saw that when we added it to pure oxygen, it burned more vigorously. So you need to have fuel and a constant supply of oxygen, even if it's just oxygen from the air, for burning. And remember, burning is a combustion reaction. So if you don't have any more fuel, like your burning splint completely burns itself out, or if you run out of oxygen or don't have access to oxygen somehow or another, then the reaction would come to a halt. So think about blowing out a candle. We know that when you blow out the candle, there's still oxygen in the air, but what are you doing when you're blowing out? When you're exhaling, what are most of the gases that you're exhaling? 
and even if those gases only surround the flame for an instant what's happening to oxygen so I want you to think about that when you try to answer B3 and that should make this helpful so this is a relatively short lab you'll want to be uh, as clear as possible in your explanations give nice complete sentences and uh, that will finish this lab off thank you very much